It's midsummer, 1976, and a man named Oscar Muller hears a knock at his door. He opens it to find one of his neighbors telling Oscar not to use the bathroom on the first floor. Oscar asks why, and the neighbor calmly explains, it's blocked up with guts. Naturally, this piques his curiosity, so he walks upstairs, opens a bathroom stall, looks inside the toilet, and sees crimson colored water and the remains of what appears to be an animal. He calls a local plumber who inspects the bathroom thoroughly, but he makes a different conclusion. These are definitely not the remains of an animal, but rather a child. Hi everyone, my name is Jack Neal, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, where we cover all things horrifying, disturbing, and morbid. In today's video, we're talking about three cannibals that you may or may not have heard of, and the cases gradually get more disturbing. If you haven't already, make sure to murder that like button, or else. Let's get into today's video, and don't forget, look behind you. Joaquin Kroll is born April 17, 1933, in Poland during World War II. He's the youngest of eight kids, and his family, like many other families at this time, are suffering from extreme poverty. Joaquin's father is taken as a prisoner of war by the Russian army, leaving him and his seven siblings with a single mom. He's seen as the weak link of the family, both physically and mentally with his IQ of 76, and he's also the only one in the family that can't read. This causes him to struggle immensely in school, where Joaquin's forced to repeat grades multiple times until eventually he decides that he's had enough. At age 15, Joaquin drops out of the fourth grade and begins working full time with his mom on the family farm. It's there that he sees a pig being slaughtered for the first time, and this experience deeply changes him, but more on that later. Joaquin then begins his first romantic relationship with a girl, but she's very critical of him, so he sees it as a complete failure. He then starts obsessing over death, because you can't criticize someone when you're dead, and it becomes an integral part of his sex life. At around the same time, in 1955, Joaquin's mother passes away, and this tragic event, coupled with his morbid curiosity, sends Joaquin down a spiral of very concerning behaviors, and it starts with blow-up dolls. He has countless of them, scattered all throughout his apartment, and at first uses them how they're supposed to be used, but eventually he takes things even further. He already likes the fact that the dolls don't move or speak, but it's strangling them that really fulfills his dark, twisted desires. Just three weeks after his mother's death, Joaquin lures a teenage girl to a barn under the premise that he's giving her a nice gift. He then strangles the poor girl to death and subjects her body to unspeakable acts that become signature aspects of his future killings. Joaquin's next known murder takes place five years later in June 1959 in an almost identical fashion. However, this time he takes pieces of the young girl's body parts, wraps them up, and cooks them for dinner. These two killings spark a murder spree that spans over the course of 20 years and result in the deaths of 13 women ages 4 to 61. The murders all have similar details, and consist of Joaquin luring women to a remote location, strangling them with his bare hands, and doing whatever he pleases with their bodies post-mortem. However, in the case of 13-year-old Petra Geese, he uses the girl's own scarf to take her life on Easter Sunday, 1962. Just four years later, he drowns five-year-old Ilona Hark by holding her head underwater in a nearby stream, simply because he wants to know what it feels like to drown someone. This all comes to an end, though, on July 3rd, 1976, when police receive a call from one of Joaquin's neighbors, Oscar Muller, who tells them the waste pipe in his apartment is blocked up, and he and the plumber have an idea of what's been blocking the pipe. When police arrive on scene, they too recognize that the remains inside the toilet are that of a young girl. Coincidentally, a local neighborhood girl has recently gone missing, so when police go to Joaquin's apartment to investigate, 
they're stunned to see the body of four-year-old Marion Ketter cut into pieces. Some are in the refrigerator, some are in the boiling pot that he's actively cooking, and many are in the waste pipe. Now, I want you to think back to the beginning of the story. Joaquin literally told his neighbor that there are guts in the pipe and proceeded to be cooking them at the same time. Just a reminder that this man is not the brightest and it is shocking to me that it took police this long just to find him. Joaquin's arrested and immediately confesses to 13 other murders and one attempted killing over the past couple decades. And when asked why he's cutting off portions of his victims and eating them, he simply claims that he was doing it to save on his grocery bills. Now, lack of education or just a not so well thought out excuse, that's for you guys to decide. But to me, it's rather unfortunate that due to the large amount of time between each of these murders, along with Joaquin committing them in distant towns rather than his local community, police falsely convict three separate men of his crimes. And even though none of them actually did anything, they each take their own life because none of them want the reputation of such a monster. Joaquin's taken into custody, and there he's under the impression that he'll be given some sort of operation that will cure him of his cannibalistic condition, and he'll simply be released from prison and go off on his merry way. Not exactly how it works. Instead, after being forced to demonstrate the killings through a series of haunting reconstruction pictures, Joaquin Kroll is charged with eight murders and one attempted murder. But Jack, I thought this guy killed 13 people. Well, yeah, but we don't want to bring up any of those false convictions, would we? In April 1982, he's sentenced to life in prison, but dies just nine years later of a heart attack. In the early 2000s, a series of killings takes place in South Korea, and the man responsible often wears a raincoat while stalking and murdering his victims. He typically targets rich, upper-class couples and sex workers and is known for eating their organs. This is the story of one of the most prolific serial killers in South Korean history, and we'll be taking a deep dive into the events that led Yoo Young Chil to become the Raincoat Killer. Yu was born April 18, 1970 in Seoul, South Korea. His father, a Vietnam veteran, hasn't been able to bring in money to his family since he's returned from war. Being the poor kid in school, Yu gets bullied by his classmates, which fuels a hatred for rich people deep inside him. Around this time, his father starts to develop a gambling addiction, and when he gambles, he drinks, and when he drinks, he becomes a completely different person. Yu's abused for years mentally with hurtful comments and physically with his father's special hand. At age 15, his dad gets involved in a fatal car accident, which leads Yu to finally start to come out of his shell. He's a hardworking student, a talented athlete in gymnastics and track, and he's even a bit of an artist. Yu even attempts to get into a secondary school specifically for art, but fails because he's colorblind. Instead, Yu begins studying computers, and that's when things start to take a dark turn. It starts with a record. He sees it at a local shopping center, but he doesn't have the money, so why would he feel bad taking it? He then begins harassing his fellow classmates, is caught trespassing late at night, and is sent to jail. However, when he gets out of jail in 1991, he meets his wife, and the two soon after have a baby boy. But over the next few years, he's in and out of prison several times for various crimes, so he doesn't get to see his family much. This starts to take a toll on his wife, who's beginning to become a single mom, and in the year 2000, she's had enough. It's at this time, Yu is sentenced to three and a half years in prison for assaulting a teenage girl. His wife files for divorce, and he is left with nothing. And this is Yu's breaking point. He stops speaking, stops spending time with other people altogether, and while in prison, he plots a plan to seek revenge on his ex-wife and only child. When he's finally released in 2003, Yu immediately goes to his wife's home where he sees his baby boy. He's seeking vengeance, ready to kill his son and wife, but when he sees his baby boy's eyes, he can't go through with it. Instead, he turns his attention to his wife, who's 
Drinking a beer and eating a piece of seaweed. Somewhere deep down, he's able to feel remorse and thinks to himself, they're struggling enough. However, this by no means satiates Yu's bloodthirsty nature, so instead, he travels to a wealthy neighborhood in South Korea and breaks into the home of Mr. and Mrs. Lee. He climbs through the window and spots Mr. Lee sitting on his couch. Mr. Lee stands up in panic and then Yu stabs him and he looks around to find his wife. She assumes that they're being robbed, so she rushes to the closet, grabs all the money she can find, gives it to Yu, begging for her life. He then looks Mrs. Lee straight in the eyes and says, Do you think I'm doing this for the money? And proceeds to end her life with a hammer. This crime sparks the start of Yu's killing spree on the wealthy, which continues in October of 2003, where he breaks into another family's home. It's there that he kills a grandmother, a wife, and a son with a disability. And just days later on October 16th, he threatens the wife of a millionaire with a blade. He asks her if anyone else is home, she says no, so again, you take someone's life with a hammer. He trespasses into one more home on November 18th, where he sees a family's housekeeper and demands where the master bedroom is. Yu walks upstairs, opens the door, and sees a married couple laying on their bed with a newborn baby. He takes the infant, covers its head with a blanket, and proceeds to attack its parents. He doesn't want anyone to catch on to him, so he tries to make it look like a robbery, opens the case, and cuts himself. Again, Yu does not want to get caught, so he destroys the evidence by setting the house on fire. Luckily though, the baby's actually rescued, but left with not a lot. Fast forward to December 2003, Yu begins dating a girl who works as an escort. He begins to fall in love with her, buying her presents and even getting to the point where he's about to propose, but that's when she finds out about his criminal record. She tries to break off the relationship, but Yu does not take no for an answer. He holds her captive and gets to the point where he's just about to end her life, but he ends up letting her go because again, there's too much evidence. At this point, Yu's left with nothing more than a broken heart and a deep-rooted hatred for women. This triggers him to target women who remind him of his ex-girlfriend, so he makes a call to a massage parlor and requests that an escort come to his home. But once the 24-year-old girl arrives at his apartment, Yu bludgeons her unconscious with a hammer and takes off her head in his bathroom. He repeats this hauntingly similar crime with eight other women, posing as a police officer arresting girls, forcing them to call their parents and say they're okay right before he killed them. And the most disturbing detail of all, you would eat the livers of each of his victims. Two days after completing his final murder, the massage parlor becomes suspicious. The next time Yu tries to order his next victim, they arrange to meet in public where he's met by the guys who run the parlor. They detain Yu, call the police, and he's sent off in handcuffs. However, a reminder that Yu isn't your average criminal, he's highly intelligent and he's quite the manipulator. He starts going absolutely ballistic on the police, acting like he's having a seizure and begging them to take his restraints off. They remove his handcuffs in an effort to calm him down, and when one of the police officers gets distracted, Yu makes a run for it. Thankfully, he's recaptured just 12 hours later, but if he wasn't, it's quite likely that to this day we would have a murderer on the loose. Yu's officially taken into custody July 15th, 2004, where he immediately admits to killing 19 people. Upon further investigation, police start to realize that these murders have an obvious trajectory. First, Yu kills wealthy people because he's experienced childhood poverty. Then his attention shifts toward women working as escorts because he's had a lover who did the same job abandon him. Yu's actually asked about this on trial and he's quoted saying, Women shouldn't be sluts, and the rich should know what they've done. While he does admit that he is sorry for his actions, Yu is quite adamant that if he hadn't been caught, he'd definitely still be out there killing. On December 13th, 2004, Yu's found guilty on 20 counts of first degree murder and is given the death penalty. However, South Korea hasn't utilized the death penalty since 1997, so Yu Young Chil is still on death row.
May 7, 2007. In a small town called Kurum in the Czech Republic, a man named Edward is setting up a baby monitor for his newborn son. However, as he's tuning the device, it picks up a strange signal. Edward glances at the screen, and to his horror, he sees a child. But it's not his kid. It's a young boy, completely nude, with his hands tied behind his back, and he appears to be eating off the floor of a concrete room. And ever so often, Edward sees a hand reaching over, offering the little boy bits of food. Now, the thing about baby monitors is they're not going to pick up a signal from another country or city. No, they're not that strong. Edward soon makes this realization and realizes that that means the child is very, very close by. He calls the police, who go door to door, searching all throughout the neighborhood until they come across a little yellow house. It's the home of two sisters, 31-year-old Clara and 33-year-old Katerina Morova. They let them inside, and at first they seem normal and cooperative, but then things change as police step toward a locked small door. Clara and her sister Katerina are adamant that police are by no means going inside that cellar, so they're forced to call the fire department, who knocks down the door, and to no surprise, the boy from the baby monitor. He's tied up, covered in his own waist, and appears totally malnourished. Police rescue the eight-year-old who goes by Andre, his brother Jacob, and another young girl who says she's their adopted sister, 13-year-old Annika. Clara and Katarina are immediately arrested while the three kids are taken into questioning. Police start asking the boys about the marks and scratches on their bodies, and they say that they're from their pet hamster, but eventually they start telling the police about the abuse. They explain how they were kept in cages, gagged so they couldn't scream, given electric shocks, cigarette burns, and even scratched with forks. With every painful detail, they're constantly justifying their mother's actions, saying that they were the ones responsible, and they deserved it. However, things are completely different when police question Annika, who explains that she experienced no abuse at all. Let's rewind two years to 2005. Clara Morova is a single mom, raising her two sons, with the occasional help of her older sister, Katerina. The boys have a pretty happy life, going on adventures and spending their time not in school at summer camps or playing sports. It's at around this time that Clara and Katarina are introduced to a 13-year-old named Annika. She's an orphan girl, originally from Norway, and has an absolutely traumatic past. Previously, she was taken by a sex trafficking gang back home and is currently on the run, suffering from many rare medical conditions. She's partially blind, has leukemia, and is even diagnosed with autism. Clara then begins to develop a relationship with the girl and starts treating her as though she's her own daughter. Her sister, Katerina, also wants to help out, so she does her part by taking Annika to the hospital whenever she needs to go see her doctor. Now, Clara's only met Annika's doctor on one occasion, but it's late one night in a car and she can't even make out his face. Still, the doctor shows her a diplomatic passport in all of Annika's medical records, so Clara gives him her number and trusts him as if he's any other medical professional. She then begins receiving text messages with special instructions on how to care for Annika. Most notably, she tells her it is imperative that she rubs the girl on her crotch area for several hours at a time because this will make Annika happy. Oh, sorry guys, one tiny detail that I left out. Annika is actually a 31-year-old woman named Barbara Skorlova. And old Barbara is a bit of an actress. She'd actually gone to a school of dramatic arts, gotten liposuction and a breast reduction to make herself look like a teenage girl. However, Clara knows none of this, and she just wants to help a poor, innocent teen with a traumatic past grow and have a better life. She sees her as one of her own, and will do whatever it takes to help her heal, even if it means neglecting her sons. Over the next year, the boys, Jacob and Andre, start spending more and more time with their grandparents, while Clara begins the adoption process for Annika. 
However, Annika makes it very clear that she is not comfortable being a part of the family because the boys are mean and abusive toward her. Clara, completely thrown off and distraught by this, starts messaging the doctor asking for help, and he tells her that the only way she can fix the boy's evil nature is with tough love and punishment. Clara starts by beating them, then eventually starts locking the brothers in small rooms every time they do something wrong, until summer 2006, the doctor recommends the only way to truly cure the boys is with shock therapy. Clara and her two sons travel to a little yellow college where they're met by Katerina, the doctor, and two other adults. And as it turns out, the doctor is actually Barbara's brother, who goes by the name Jan Skrilova. Over the next several months, Clara, her sister Katerina, Annika's brother, and two other adults keep the boys in dog cages and severely abuse them. They force them to live in their own excrement, not allowing them to talk to anyone not even each other. They hold their heads underwater up into the point where they almost drown and force them to fight each other. Jan, Annika's brother, regularly tapes their mouths shut so they can't scream and cuts off bits and pieces of the boy's flesh. He then seals the womb by burning cigarettes into their skin and everyone there eats the flesh, including the boys. Annika continues to convince Clara that the boys just won't stop abusing her, so the real abuse gets even worse. And while all this is going on, she's living the life. Annika gets her own room with all the toys in the world, meanwhile Jacob and Andre are kept in a small concrete room, standing in their own urine. Clara even goes as far as connecting a baby monitor to her TV so she can watch the boys in misery at all times. And that's when a signal gets disrupted and a neighbor sees little Andre on his baby monitor. In May 2007, Clara and Katerina are arrested and the three children are put in a home called Cloakneck, but Annika, or should I say Barbara, disappears without a trace. Four months later, she's discovered across the continent in Norway, impersonating yet another teenager. However, this time she's disguised as a 13-year-old boy named Adam and has completely shaven off all of her hair. When she's captured, investigators start to put the pieces of the case together and discover Barbara's father, Joseph Skorlova, is the leader of a cult called the Ants. And as it turns out, the family that's housing her in Norway are also members of the cult and they're trying to protect Barbara from being captured. The reason for all this? Well, there's a lot of theories, but I'll give you the two most likely to me. Since her birth, Barbara's father Joseph has used her as sort of a messiah, or a child sent by God, to grow his cult and gain more influence. Apparently, Jacob and Andre had been chosen to be her bodyguards, and the gruesome experiences they suffered were an attempt to make them desensitized to pain. Further, everyone that was in the Yellow House is also a part of the cult, despite Clara claiming numerous times that she had no idea all this was happening and she truly wanted the best for her children. However, that's just one theory. More recent investigations into the case theorize that the cult was actually a cover-up for child exploitation and the boys were being broadcasted on the dark web in exchange for money. This actually explains the TV and baby monitor and three hours worth of footage of the boys that was found in the yellow house. Despite this, there are no sexual crimes mentioned when the case is taken to trial and Clara is sentenced to nine years in prison. Her sister, Katerina, gets 10 years, Barbara's brother gets 7, and the two other adults get 7 as well. Barbara, on the other hand, actually gets a 5-year sentence and is even released 2 years early. On a brighter note, today Jacob and Andre appear to be overcoming adversity, living happy, healthy lives. And they forgive everyone involved in the case and are actively rekindling a relationship with their mother. These two have truly survived one of the worst cases of child neglect and abuse that I've ever seen, and they are not letting any of it define them. My name is Jack Neal, and as always, stay spooky.